Okay, welcome back everyone to uh, Machine Learning CMPT 726. Just a bit of recap. So we covered actually a lot last time. We talked about neural networks, what multi-layer perceptrons are, and we went over some terminology. So that was a bit of a, a review. And then uh, we did some math to kind of, um, by using a lot of these different transformations of some basic functions, so the uh, transformations of the ReLU function, we were, both, we were able to argue that any function, um, any little piece of the function on the left can be approximated by such a function. Um, so the ReLU, basically some transformation of the ReLU function subtracted from each other and then adding a constant. And therefore, we can actually combine many of these little pieces together to approximate any function, for example, the red function here, arbitrarily well. Okay, and then we show that, um, and we show that, okay, so that, that function on the right here with the summation, let me get the laser pointer out. Um, this function is actually just a single layer, multi-layer perceptron. Okay. So that was the universal approximation, uh, universal uh, function approximation uh, capabilities of the multi-layer perceptron. Okay, so, so that basically motivated the use of MLPs. Um, so next we said, okay, so now let's suppose our model was a multi-layer perceptron. How can we take the gradient with respect to gradient of the loss function with respect to all the weights of the multi-layer perceptron? And for that, we went over the multivariate chain rule and then we did a bit of practice with backpropagation um, on a very simple function. So that was this example here where um, we start from the back and then we always differentiate one step at a time. And every time we went backwards, we basically added on one more factor, which is the next derivative. Okay, so here the one is the derivative of this thing with respect to the blue part. The blue part is a previous node. And then we continue doing this, take the derivative of this function with this node with respect to the previous node. And then, so then we've got a two X plus Y added on, and then we keep going. And then this is basically a very um, efficient way of computing all of the different partial derivatives. Okay. So today we're going to apply what we have learned um, about backpropagation to the neural network. Okay. So I think uh, probably we should write this down. Okay, so backpropagation um, involves two steps. First is the forward pass and then the backward pass. So backpropagation, sometimes just called backprop. So one forward pass. So this is backprop in multi-layer perceptrons. So forward pass, we're going to start with Start with our input and the first set of weights. And then next, we're going to, so, so then after we multiply by W0, we get the pre-activation, the first pre-activation, Z1. And then we're going to apply the function Psi to get the post-activations or the hidden layer, H1. Okay, so this keeps going. So the next one would be Z2 equals to W1. Just be trying to be very careful with indices, H1. And then once we have Z2, the next pre-activation, we apply the Psi function again to get the next hidden layer. So H2 equals Psi of Z2 and so on. So basically, eventually we will always have, um, I guess we have to continue on the next line. So in general, we will have, so now we have H2. In general, Z, let me just get the indices right here. 
yeah, so L, so I'm using L in the slide, so I'm going to use L over here. Z, L plus 1, so but the next Z is always going to equal to W, L, H, L. And then also in general, when we get to H, L plus 1, that's always equal to Psi of Z, L plus 1. Okay, so that's the general case. And then at the end, just to just to write out the very last step, at the end we're gonna have H, let's see. So yeah, uh, maybe we start with the Z, probably makes more sense. Okay, so the last Z, the last pre-activation, and let me just get the indices correct. So uh, I think that's inde index L on the slide. And then that equals to W L minus one, H capital L minus one. And finally we have the last uh, the last layer. Normally we would call it H. Um, actually we, okay, so there's actually one more step on the slides. So H L, the last hidden layer, equals psi of ZL. And then finally we have our output, the output layer. Y hat equals W, L, that's right, so the, okay, WL, previously it was WL minus one, WLHL. And so this is kind of the output of the network, but we want to, um, but we actually want to take the gradient of the loss function. So we're not really done, right? So right now we have only, uh, we, we basically only have gotten to the output of the network but we still have the, yeah, we still need to apply the loss function. So the loss function is gonna be, so I guess for now, just keeping it general, some arbitrary loss function with respect to, uh, that is defined based on our output, y hat. Okay, so that's actually the last step. So what we wanna do, so what we want is actually take partial L, partial any of these weights. For example, I could say maybe W0 and then I want the, it's getting, the indices are getting complicated, but maybe I want the, maybe I want the partial derivative of L with respect to one of the components of W0. And maybe I want the one, two component, for example. Right, but in, in general, I, I could just pick anything, right? Maybe partial R, partial three, and then maybe I can have the three fourth el the three four element of of the third set of weights, weight matrix. Okay, so that so we need this because we we need to uh, use a gradient based method, for example, stochastic gradient descent, in order to optimize the loss function. So actually, so in a forward pass, that's pretty straightforward. We basically start with the input and then we just go through all the layers for in forward order and until we get to the output and then eventually we can evaluate the loss function. The second step after that is the backward pass. Okay, so we're gonna do that next. Just returning to the slides a little bit. So the first step, just to sometimes it helps to see it both in writing as well as on the slides. So first we do the forward pass. We compute all the values of all the intermediate variables. So we need to save the values of all the Z's, all the H's, all the way up to ZL. That's the last hit. Uh, that's the last pre-activation, and then HL, the last hidden layer. And finally, we get our Y hat. So that's the forward pass. So typically, uh, so typically when we do the forward pass, we already have some data point here that is known. So remember with machine learning, we have to keep track of what is known and what is unknown. So the X is known. 
the the label corresponding to x, which is y, is also known. What is unknown are all these w's. But in, initially, we can randomly initialize, just pick some random numbers for all the w's. And then, so now we have a random set of w's. We can plug in our x, all the w's, and we can always compute all of, all of the z's and h's until we get to the predicted output of our current model. Current model means the model parameterized by the current set of weights. So the model defined by the current set of weights. Okay, so given the input and the random w's, we can do the forward pass relatively easily. And then we just have to keep track of, we have to save all of these z's and h's and y. Okay, so now the backward pass. Okay, so now back to the written notes. So obviously this is what we want in the end, but we need to take it step by step. So we're going to go from the outside. So now we're going to go backwards, right? We're going to take the derivatives one step at a time backwards. That's how, that's kind of how the backward pass works. Okay. So this is what we want as, in, as some example, but we're going to do this more generally. So the first step is going to be partial L. Um, let's do, so for example, uh, I guess one thing to note is that partial L partial Y hat is known. Because we choose, we choose the loss function. So we should know what the gradient of the loss function with respect to the output should be. So that's known. So we don't need to do that. Let's do the next one. Um, so, so let's do partial L. So derivative of L with respect to HL. So now we can use the multivariate chain rule and I'm going to now going to do this in vector form. So this is actually going to equal to partial y hat, partial h l times partial h uh, partial l. Okay, so we have y to h l, so we need l to y. Okay, so this thing is known. And then this partial y, the derivative of y with respect to hl, well, we can just look here. This is a matrix multiplication. So from before, we saw that this should be whatever matrix is in front, transpose. So that's our first step. So now we have gone from l to hl. So now let's do one more step and go, let's compute the derivative of hl with respect to ZL. Okay. So we don't need to do the partial derivative of L again, because we're just going to do it step by step. So right now we just need uh, partial HL over partial Z L. So that is actually going to be so. So remember what? So I think we have to go back a little bit and remember what how what the relationship between H L and Z L is, right? So let me scroll up all the way to this part. So this is the relationship between H and Z. Basically, um, basically, the psi function is just going to component-wise apply the function g, which is the activation function on the different components of z. So basically, what we have here, right? Maybe it makes more sense to do it over here. And now I'm going to kind of omit some of the indices. I guess here we should have had a arrow up here. So this is a Jacobian of, of H. 
So in the Jacobian, at least with our convention, we're going to take all the partial derivatives with respect to the first component in the first row. And then we're going to take these partial derivatives with respect to, uh, sorry, we're, all of these partial derivatives are of the first component of H. Okay, so this H1 is actually just the first component of H we have here. So this is really, so H1, I'm not sure what that was. Okay, anyway, so H1 in our case is actually just G of Z1. Okay, and then here we have H2 all the way up to the last component, I guess we can call it Hn. Okay, so that's basically what's happening in the, in the first row, in the first column, is always going to be the partial derivatives of H1. And the second row is going to be with respect to Z2, and eventually we get with respect to the last component of Z. So it's going to be Z n. So just looking here, Z has n components, and n I guess could depend on the layer, but for now we're not labeling the layer, we're doing this generally. The key, I guess the only thing we should pay attention to is that eventually when we put back the indices, the index of H are, is gonna equal to the index of Z. Okay, so we'll do that at the end. Okay, and then this keeps going, right? The whole matrix looks like this. I guess maybe it's worth just writing down the last component. So that's just gonna be the partial derivative of the last component of H. with respect to the last component of Z. Okay. So this is actually, this is just the Jacobian definition of the Jacobian. So let me move this up a little bit. I'm gonna copy everything to the very bottom of the slides later on, uh, of the written notes. So we can do each of these partial derivatives. So partial one, partial Z one, that's just gonna give us G prime of Z1. Because this is just a, G is the activation function. We're not really saying what exactly it is. It could be ReLU, it could be 10H. Um, yeah, but, but we, know what the, what we know what the derivative of G is because we picked the activation function. So this is something known. Okay, so next we're going to take this, uh, the partial derivative of the second component with respect to Z1. But then the second component only involves Z2, so that's gonna be zero. And similarly, all the other components of H will not depend on Z1. So we're just gonna get a, all, the, all zeros for the rest of the first row. Okay, so now we can move down to the second, um, to the second row. So here we're gonna take the partial derivative of the first component here, H1, with respect to Z2. But then this, this element, this component doesn't depend on Z2, so we get zero. The next partial derivatives, I guess we'll just write out one more. This one is going to be partial H2, partial Z2. So here, because the indices match, hopefully you can see the pattern, because indices match, we'll just get G prime of Z2. Okay, and then next we're gonna get zero because it will be, it's gonna be partial H3, partial Z2 over here. So that's gonna be zero. And then it's gonna be all zeros until the very end. And basically, if you look at this entire matrix, the only places where you don't get zero is the diagonal. And the diagonals are just gonna be G prime of all the corresponding index of Z until you get G prime of Zn.
Okay. Um, actually, in this case, uh, previously we were actually letting the index of z only go up to n minus one. Um, but you can kind of relabel this as n, for example. Um, it's sort of arbitrary, but the point is that we'll just get a diagonal matrix here. Okay, so now let's copy it over here. So I'm, I'm going up to the index n because it matches better with the slides. Unfortunately, the slides are a little bit in inconsistent. Okay, so here we're gonna go up to index n for here. Um, there's, there's gonna be another one below, but that's okay. The one is not really um, that component. So that compo the one component is basically h, we can think of it as h n plus one, for example, but but that one is a constant, so, so we don't have to worry about it. Let's focus on the part that actually depends on Zn. Okay, so, so if you do take if you do take the one into account, then actually we should do that, but I won't. Uh, if you do want to take the one into account, the one would be more like, you would have another row here, uh, another column here, partial h, partial h plus one, but this is always one, right? Yeah, let me use the eraser. So we have another column here, which is partial h, partial z, n plus one, uh, sorry, partial h, n plus one, and then all the different partial derivatives. But then this is always gonna be one because it's a constant. And then you, you will have partial z1. And then here you, you just get a column of partial derivatives of one. Okay, and then all of these will just be zero. So if we if we take the entire um, if we if we stick to this convention here with the one at the end, then we will just get a column of zeros at the end. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. But for the purpose of just matching things better with the slides, I'm going to ignore this column of zero from from this point on. And then I'm going to say that the index, um, the the index of z and h they go up to n, unlike what we have here with the n minus one. Okay, so so hopefully that makes sense. So let us copy all of this down to the very bottom, and then we can continue. We were trying to do partial H capital L partial Z capital L up here. But here, what we have done so far is actually the more general case. What we have done is kind of correct for any, for any index. Right, so this is the first hidden layer. But I could have done the same thing for any layer number. So I'm going to put all of those in because I have already done all the work for every layer. So this is just going to be, so the indexing gets a little ugly here. So indexing gets ugly. So I will omit, right? But what we should be doing here is, for example, it should be HL the h, the, the lth hidden layer, and then the first component of that, of the lth hidden layer for, for this one. And then for the z, it's also gonna be the lth hidden layer and then first component. But that's a lot to write, I won't really fill that in. Um, hopefully you get the idea. What's more important is actually down here where we do, we should write down zl1, zl2. Maybe it's better if I just erase and redo this.
Yeah, this is kind of just bookkeeping, but I think you get you guys probably get the idea. Okay, so that the elf layer and then second component. Three. And then that L. And then I need more room here. So it's going to be ZL and then N sub L. So this is, so this is basically ZL means the pre-activation in the ELF layer. And then NL means the NL component. Um, NL means number of components uh, in, uh, another way of saying this it number of units or neurons right so remember the terminology number of components in Z L okay so in general we could have a different number of components in each layer so that's why we need to have an index L even for the N okay so hopefully um, hopefully that's not too confusing. Okay. So let's kind of go up, go back up here and see what we have done so far. So we started off with partial L, partial HL. So next we did partial HL, partial ZL. That's over here. And then that actually applies to every layer, not just uh, not just capital L. Okay, so so now we can, so next we can actually do partial, we can connect everything together and then do partial L with respect to, so partial L, partial HL. So let's do that. So actually just to make things a little neater, I'm gonna move things again. So this is quite an ugly thing to write down, but we'll do this once. And after you guys know how everything works, you guys don't need to think about it anymore when you're using multi-layer perceptrons. So let's move over here to create more room. Okay, so now we have uh, partial L, partial Z, L any index that always equals to using the chain rule we have partial h little l partial z l which is what we had over here right the final result was down here and then using the chain rule this is partial l we need a, another partial l partial h l like that okay so for example, what we have so far is that if little l equals to capital L, then we would know what partial big L over partial Z capital L, because we know what this one is. We just calculated that. And then we also know what the second part is. That was actually just W, big W, big L transpose. Okay, so let's return to the slides to look at these two steps one more time. So the backward pass, eventually we want to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the first layer weights and biases. So actually all layer weights and biases, but of course the first layer is the deepest one, is the one that is farthest away from the output. So that requires the most, um, most, thing, uh, most terms in, the, in using the chain rule. So the first thing we did was um, partial L, partial HL. So basically going from the loss function, which depends on y hat, um, partial derivative of that with respect to HL. So that one was basically partial L, partial Y, which we know, and then partial Y, partial HL. And partial Y, partial HL, highlighted here, that's just equal to WL transpose. Okay, so that was the first step. For the next step, we wanted to go a bit deeper. So that was partial L, partial HL only here. We want to go partial 
L partial ZL, for example, and ZL is defined to be inside, that's de defined to be uh, the inside of the Psi function. So to do that, we can apply the chain rule. And in fact, here, we don't even need to look at the last layer. We can just look at any arbitrary layer, little L. So partial big L par partial Z little L equals to, so partial H partial Z for all layers times partial big L partial HL. And we can now expand out because we know the relationship between the hidden layer and the pre-activation. This is just application of the Psi function. We have seen in the written notes that we just get a diagonal matrix of all the derivatives of the activation function. Okay, so that's so those were the two steps we 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 have done so far. So now the only thing we need to do is to figure this out. Well, maybe that's not the only thing, but next we're going to figure out what partial L partial HL is. We have actually already done this for the last layer, but we want to do this for every layer. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. So let's go back to the written notes to do it more slowly. Okay, so let me rearrange the whiteboard a little bit. So this comment can get in here. And then this one, I guess we'll put it down here so that I can have one more column to work with over here. Basically, we just calculated this one. Now we're gonna calculate this, this term partial L, partial HL. So again, using the chain rule, how, how can we get to partial L, partial HL? Well, how can we go from L to, let's say, any of the inner H's like this one? Well, we can actually compute partial L, partial Z, cap, partial Z, and then do partial Z, partial L, right? So uh, we'll write this out. So let me just make sure you can see. So we're going to go partial L, partial the next Z. Look at the index. This is L. This is L minus 1 here, right? So this is really in general Z L plus 1. And then I guess the for the chain rule, we have to do it in the right order in multivariables. So this actually goes second. The order matters. And then we have ZL plus 1 over Z uh, over HL. Okay, so let's do this step and then, which is pretty easy to be honest. Let's do this step and then we're going to summarize. So this actually equal to, what, what does that equal? If you look at any of the relationships between the next Z and the previous H, right? In general, ZL plus one equals WL HL. Well, that means that we, we're just going to get something very similar to the output layer here. It would just be W, let me make sure the index is correct. W little L transpose. And then partial L, partial Z, L plus one. Okay, so that's what we have so far. Okay, and let me, yeah, rearranging, rearrange some things. And then we'll move this one over as well. Okay, so we start with the loss function with respect to the last layer, and then we have this, uh, I guess we need to complete this, right? This should be, should be a partial L, partial Y hat. Can't, can't, can't miss that. Okay, so we know partial L, partial last H, so H big L. From that, we can use We can then compute partial L, 
partial ZL because we know because this expression is for L little l equals 1 2 all the way up to capital L right so now if you imagine that we're in index capital L then we would know this term and then for this part we look to the left right for this part remember that was just a diagonal I guess this should go all the way down here this is a diagonal matrix that we had so now we can have partial L partial Z capital L once we have that so let me let's do some bookkeeping right so initially known this is known that part so that means we can actually compute this one can compute let's label these let's label this one and label this two maybe we label this zero right so this is from zero so next we can compute we can just go backward one more step and we can do partial l partial z capital l we can compute this using equation one with little l equals to big L okay so I mean if you really want to see it this is equal to again this is a diagonal matrix and then multiply by capital uh, big partial L partial HL capital L so that was up here Okay, so let's not make this so messy. Basically, I'll erase these arrows. Hopefully you can see that we can compute that. Okay. So next, so next what we're gonna do, if we're just doing a back propagation example, we can then go down the indices. Partial L, partial H, L minus one. If you look up here, this is actually equal to Okay, so I'll just say can compute And this is based on equation 2 With L equals L minus 1 All Right, so if you look at equation 2 This would be equal to partial Z little l is l minus 1 so l plus 1 is going to be big l so partial h l minus 1 and then we have partial l partial z l and again this part we just computed here and then this part is actually just a W over here right so where everything is known so we can compute this again not gonna make things too messy that's the kind of the point we can always keep going down the indices slowly and then we can compute everything based on the results from uh, based on the previous derivatives Okay, maybe I'll just do one more. So next, maybe we want partial L. So this is the post activation. If we go one deep, one step deeper, then we get the partial derivative with respect to the pre activations of that same layer. And this one we can compute. Okay, and then you use equation one with little the index being L minus one, right? And if you want, you can always keep going 
So let's say you want to you want the post activations of the the previous layer again. We can compute this. Okay, and then we use equation two with l equals l minus two. So equation one allows us to connect the post activations with the pre activations, and then equation two allows us to connect them for two different indices. So we can always go, we can always keep going until we get, for example, partial L, uh, partial Z1, and then partial L, partial H1 as well, right? Actually, uh, yeah. So actually the H would show up first. Uh, so I will swap the order. Just give me one sec. A lot of moving things today. So we can compute all of this. Okay. Same logic, but of course the L, the index is just gonna be one here and then index is gonna be zero. Okay, so now we have computed all, all of the partial derivatives of the loss function with respect to the, the pre and post activations. So that's kind of the procedure of backpropagation, tying it all together. Um, so we're not done yet. Remember in the end, we want the partial derivatives with respect to all the weights, um, but this is pretty close. We, we have the partial derivatives with all the hidden, uh, with all the hidden layers and also all the pre activations. So let's kind of visit the notes quickly. So the last thing we did was to connect the different indices. So the next, we're connecting the next, um, the next pre-activation with the previous post-activation. And then again, the only, we just get a WL matrix coming out. So that's what we saw in the written notes, All right? So that was what we were doing up here before I try to summarize everything and how to get all the gradients with respect to all the pre and post activations. Okay, so lastly, this is what we actually care about. We want to take the partial derivative of L with respect to all of these weights. So all of these weights are actually a bit annoying to work with because they're matrices. So what we're gonna do instead is we're going to take the partial derivative of the weights uh, of just one, uh, uh, let's see, so this is L, J, and then colon. So this is one row, right? So we're just gonna take the partial derivative of L with respect to one row of the weights. So again, let's, um, so let's go back to the written notes. Okay, so maybe I can make the things, I'll need another section on the left here to do this. So now we want partial L partial, just one row, we want the elf layer, the weights in the elf layer, and we want the jth row of that ma weight matrix. Okay, and that is gonna be equal to partial ZL plus one over partial W and then this is what we want, lj dot, and then partial l, partial z, l plus one, uh, yeah. Okay, so basically, just to go back to the general formula here, we would like to take the, we would like to take the partial derivative of l with respect to one row of these weights. So we're, we're gonna use the chain rule. We're going to take the partial derivative of L with, with respect to the next, um, the next pre-activation first, and then we're gonna take the partial derivative of this pre-activation with respect to the weights, again, using the chain rule. Okay, so that's what we're doing down here. So for this one, we need a bit of visualization so we need to know what the weight matrix looks like. 
and then uh, we'll work it out from uh, from there. Just give me one second here. Okay, so let's so let's write down what the matrix WL looks like. The WL is going to be some matrix. And then WL, the vector WL comma J comma dot will just be the Jth Jth row. Okay, so, so that's what that's what WLJ looks like. It's gonna be here. A little slow my computer. One second. So let me erase this to make it a bit nicer. So this matrix sorry yeah, this matrix WL will get multiplied by so again, WL gets will multiply HL over here. So HL will be some vector, which has as many rows as the number of columns, uh, as, yeah, as many rows as the number of columns of W. So I think I call this a transpose. Just because normally for vectors we have columns, but here's a row vector. So row vector gets a transpose. So here well, we have basically this vector or all the rows multiplying h, and that gives you the next, that gives you the z over here. So each row in a product with the h will give you one element of the next Z. So the next row of WL times HL will give you the next component of ZL of ZL plus one. Okay, so in particular, what we're doing here, let me highlight things a little bit. In particular, oh, sorry. In particular, we have the jth row, just gonna color code, multiply by HL. That will give us, uh, it's a little hard to write. Let me move things a little bit again, sorry. Yeah, actually a better way of doing this would be, would be this. Just bear with me. We're almost done. Two minutes should be enough. Okay, this is WL, this is HL, and this is Z L plus one. When we take the red part, Multiply by HL, we will get one the jth component of ZL plus one. We'll get this one. So this is the jth row. So now we can kind of write down again this part is known, so we only have to write this down, right? Okay. So that means partial Z L plus one, partial W L J dot transpose. Again, this is derivative of a vector with respect to another vector. So this is the Jacobian. So we're gonna have partial Z L plus one, the first component over partial Uh, w L J instead of the dot it's going to be the first component in fact the entire row will be 
with the derivative with with respect to the first component of WLJ. Okay, and then what we're taking the partial derivative of will change each with each element. So that's going to give us Z L plus one comma one up here, right, and so on. Okay, it turns out that we we need a little bit more time, but let me just summarize a little bit. Um, the point here is that this is the only term we need to compute to get the partial derivative of our loss function with respect to the weights. The way we're going to proceed is to write out this matrix and then it's kind of actually going to simplify quite a bit. You will notice that uh, when we take the partial derivative of Z L plus one, the first component, which is actually up here, that component depends on this part. It does not depend on the red part. So all of these things are going to be zero. Only when you get to the jth row here, you will finally start to have this part depending on uh, the, the, uh, the row of WL that we're concerned with. So then you will get something over here. But so this matrix will turn out to be mostly zeros except for one column. Okay, so I guess we'll probably need to continue this next time. Um, but uh, yeah, but the final result is basically that. Actually, yeah, actually, it's going to be one of the columns being non-zero, and then a lot of the other columns being zero. But uh, we're going to look at this next time. Um, but the point is that once we have done this, we would have computed the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to any weight that we want. Okay, so that's all for today. I'll see you guys next time. Have a great weekend.